UCLA football face plants in the Sun Bowl. Caleb Williams says it's all systems go for USC in the Cotton Bowl. And Anthony Davis says his foot is healing ahead of schedule for the Lakers. Good morning. I'm James. This is your daily dose of sports and snark for the greatest sports city in the world, Los Angeles. This is the Faithful Angelinos Morning Report. I am broadcasting from the Anchorage, Alaska airport. By the time this clip drops, I'm going to be somewhere, I don't know, over Oregon heading back home. And that's going to be a beautiful thing because I need me some sun in my life. If you like the content, meanwhile, that we put out about LA Sports, clickety-clack the like button. Clickety-clack the subscribe button. There's a notifications bell. Hit that. It'll let you know we drop new content. Sharing is caring. Let people know we exist. And by all means, comment. Happy New Year. That would be a comment. What the hell? Before we go through the news and notes, we're going to take a look at the scoreboard. Pittsburgh with a backup quarterback, with a backup running back, down by two touchdowns in the second half, still managed to pull off the upset. And we have to go into detail about that in a moment. Pittsburgh 37, 18th ranked UCLA 35. Ouch. Meanwhile, LeBron James, happy birthday. The man scored 47 points. He missed a triple-double by just one assist. Lakers 130, Atlanta 121. College basketball, Jaime Jaquez Junior scores 20 points. UCLA gets its ninth consecutive win. The 11th ranked Bruins 67, but just one point, 67 to 66 over Washington State. And USC winds up with an easier time in Washington, 80 to 67. Boogie Ellis scores 27 points. Meanwhile, today, both games for LA teams are going to take place in the afternoon. Philadelphia is going to take on the Kings. The Kings are just two points behind the Vegas Golden Knights for first place in the Pacific Division. Also, the Clippers are in Indiana. The Clippers have moved ahead a little bit of Dallas for fourth in the Western Conference. But we have to go into detail about the Sun Bowl, particularly if you are a UCLA fan. Now, you guys already know, I like USC, but I respect UCLA of the tradition of Wooden, Aikman, Donahue, etc. I'm not a hater, but I still have to ask you, what the hell was that? Gotta be real with you. A two-touchdown lead in the second half, halfway through, should have been put on ice, particularly against a backup quarterback and a backup running back. And I recognize that Thompson Robinson, Dorian Thompson Robinson, didn't have a particularly good day. He threw three interceptions. Two of the interceptions were in the red zone, which cost UCLA chances to pad their score even higher. But still, I have a new question, and it's all about the UCLA defense. Because in my opinion, that's what cost the Bruins the game, and I don't think it's that much of a stretch to say so. You see... When we were looking at this Bruins schedule at the beginning of the year, the idea was the Bruins will rack up a bunch of easy wins at the beginning of the year, then things will get tough, but they'll get a diff- they'll get a, a bowl game, they'll win it, they'll get themselves a lot of momentum with the move to the Big Ten. This loss hurts that move to the Big Ten because at some point you have to stop somebody, and UCLA did not do it. See... All this time, I was thinking that the defense was struggling because defensive coordinator Bill McGovern was out with a health issue. And I was sitting there thinking, well, you had Clancy Pendergast calling plays. Clancy Pendergast was run out on a rail from USC because the Trojans' defense was definitely undisciplined. Now I'm not so sure. And I want you to tell me what you think about this. Because look, the early part of the season... Okay, the defense was kind of holding its own. But for the last five games, since the calendar turned to November, since the calendar turned to November, UCLA gave up 36 points per game. The path to victory for UCLA football was that that offense had so much skill that they were going to drop 40 points. And you figure a defense that allowed somewhere in the mid-20s, they would just run the table but they allowed 36 points per game, which means sometimes they allowed way more than 40. The the USC game, for example. So this is not good. (laughs) I mean, 
if the idea is your offense can score 40 points and who can keep up, but your defense is almost allowing just, that's extremely alarming. I mean, Pittsburgh, they didn't play defense at all yesterday. Yeah, I mentioned the three picks by Thompson Robinson, but you could argue two of them were bobbled by the intended receiver. The Pittsburgh Panthers allowed 451 yards to UCLA. 451. They did not play defense at all either. It's about what UCLA didn't do. It's about what UCLA didn't do. So the Bruins, for example, can we say that they got tired on D? Did they get tired as the year went on because they were allowing 36 points a game? Were they wearing out? Were they easier to figure out schematically as the season wore on? The Bruins allowed four scoring drives to Pitt in the fourth quarter. Four scoring drives. The last one, the last scoring drive started with 35 seconds left to go in the entire game and Pittsburgh didn't even have a timeout. So now they're going to move to the Big Ten. Yeah, they got themselves some offensive skill. Yes, they got the number three recruit overall in the nation and quarterback Dante Moore. But how many points is Dante Moore going to have to put up in order to compete in the Big Ten? 50? There's bigger problems in UCLA than we care to admit. And I'd love to hear what you think about it. Because you can talk all you want about USC's defense, but at least Alex Grinch is being honest about it. You're not hearing a peep out of UCLA. The Bruins defense allowed a backup quarterback to throw for 224 yards and a backup running back to rush for 93 yards and two touchdowns. Nothing about that is good. Meanwhile, over at USC, Caleb Williams said he is ready to go for the Trojans in the Cotton Bowl on Monday. He said his hamstring had felt pretty good. Lincoln Riley had allegedly said that Williams would need a ton of rehab after getting injured in the Pac-12 title game. But to an extent, despite the happy talk from Williams, we have to tap the brakes on it just a little bit. Williams did not say that he could just do whatever he wanted on the field. He said, we'll see. So he's playing. We just don't know how well he's going to be playing out there. Also for USC, this is a benefit for next year. Offensive tackle Michael Tarkin from Florida has decided to transfer to the Trojans. We spoke yesterday about another tackle, a sophomore, Jonah Mount Monheim. So what the Trojans wind up getting is, is that they get a sophomore who, with a little bit more strength, is a potential first rounder in a future NFL draft. And then you bookend that with Tarkin on the other side. So the offensive line for the Trojans, they are trying to rebuild themselves on the fly. Anthony Davis says pain in his foot has subsided considerably since he injured it two weeks ago. It was at one point in, in healthcare, they like to rate pain from one to 10. It used to be a nine closing in on a 10. Now Davis says it's just a two. However, Davis does not want to put a timetable on coming back but he is expecting to get more imaging done on the foot to see how much it is healed when the team returns to Los Angeles. Doctors currently believe that the reason for Davis's pain is a bone spur that might have happened back when he was playing in college in Kentucky. Charger safety Derwin James has avoided a suspension for his hit on Indianapolis wide receiver Ashton Doolin on Monday Night Football. James was ejected from the game, but honestly, that didn't matter because both James and Doolin have been put in the concussion protocol. We don't necessarily know even what James' status is going to be Sunday against the Rams. However, the Bolts will be excited to add Joey Bosa for Sunday's game against the Rams. Bosa has missed the last three months. He's going to be on a snap count, though, so he's not going to be playing a whole hell of a lot. The reason, of course, is that he hasn't played an actual game action. There's a significant difference between the weight room and practice and an even bigger difference from practice to an actual game situation. But with Bosa back, if you're a Chargers fan, it's going to be interesting to ask yourself what comes of Kyle Van Noy. For example, does Bosa simply spell Khalil Mack when Khalil Mack needs a rest? 
Or do both of them play simultaneously? And does that mean Van Noy gets shuffled right back to middle linebacker? Where he started off at the beginning of the year. For the Dodgers, I am aware that there are two baseball columnists who are swearing on a stack of whatever holy book that you believe that Trevor Bauer will be released. And by the way, that might happen. We don't know. But I will tell you that I don't trust either writer who has come up with that. Uh, For example, one of the writers tweeted that Aaron Judge signed with the Giants. Totally didn't happen. Now he's going to tell you everybody else's future? Sorry, dude. John Heyman. Taking that one with a salt lick, not a grain of salt. Rams rookie cornerback Kobe Durant has impressed defensive coordinator Raheem Morris. His emergence actually gives the Rams options for next year. For that matter, it even gives them options for this year. We've talked at length since this channel began about the so-called star position, the one that Jalen Ramsey plays. Ramsey is a considered, he was considered a shutdown corner until he came to LA. Now what they do is they could move him from corner to safety, nickelback, linebacker. He's even lined up at defensive end. Morris has been so impressed with Durant's production that he thinks that he could spell Jalen Ramsey when Ramsey needs a chance to catch his own breath on the sidelines. MajorLeagueSoccer.com is reporting that MLS Cup winners LAFC have signed forward Stipe Buik from Croatia. He was named to the UEFA's 40 for the future list earlier this year. But you got to ask yourself, another forward for LAFC? I mean, how many forwards do you need? You have a ton of free agents on the back line and you're still going out signing forwards. I'm starting to think that LAFC is starting to adopt the AYSO soccer strategy. Remember AYSO? You know, when you were kids, what the coaches would do in AYSO is they would have, they would play a two, three, five formation, two defensemen, three uh, midfielders and five forwards. The whole idea behind it was to score more goals so kids would get a taste for playing soccer. And of course, by the time they became adults, it didn't happen. Is LAFC going to employ five forwards at once? I'm almost tempted to think that's possible. How many forwards can this team have? By the way, if you're a Galaxy supporter, as I am, I am aware of the rumors about a potential player from the Premier League coming to the Galaxy, but I'm going to be frank with you. I'm not going to get into it right now. I simply don't trust the foreign press. Be patient. The Galaxy have moves that they are definitely going to be making. There's going to be lots and lots of names bandied about. But you let me know what you think. And I am genuinely interested in what you think about that remarkable from col- collapse by UCLA in the Sun Bowl. Now, if you enjoyed this content, don't forget to subscribe to Faithful Angelinos. We talk about LA sports every single day. Thank you for watching. I'm James. We'll be back tomorrow. Faithful Angelinos is a Kian Corte El Queso production. Take care.